Hello everyone and welcome to our basic deck building guide for the Legend of the Five Rings LCG. If you just got your hands on three core sets in particular and are looking to dive right in, this is certainly the video for you. Yeah, so this is gonna be a very basic guide just to get everybody playing as fast as possible. We're gonna run through some more advanced concepts later on future videos. We've also got some vlogs coming and we're gonna be featuring every single clan coming up in a various uh, video or blog. So, uh, check that out. Yeah, We're there for you. That'll just give you a better idea of how these clans actually function. I know during my first handful of games, there's a, there's a lot going on in this game. It's very nuanced. But once you get past five or six games, you really just have a, a better understanding. So this whole series is designed to help you get to that point without having to actually experience those first five or six games. Absolutely. So when building these decks, uh, you know, I open the core sets and I laid them out and there's a lot going on. And you haven't ever played the game, so there's just a lot of question marks. And there's two decks. And there's this two decks. Again, actually, technically three, really, if you consider the, the dynasties as well, the provinces. Yeah, the provinces, yep. Yeah. So you'll st I like to start with the dynasty deck. And so this is where a lot of your characters are going to come from. And it's actually pretty simple now in hindsight looking back. So when, when you look at the cards, actually, um, in your clan, this is the you can splash in, in Legend of the Five Rings, but in your dynasty deck. Don't worry deck, about it yet. In your dynasty deck in particular, you can't splash. This is... So there's, there's nothing to even consider. But I'm just going to lay out really quick the cards that are Lion, uh, which we'll be using in this example. We'll find something amazing about all of this very soon. Very soon in indeed. In terms so of the quantities. I'm laying these out. I guess we could have laid these out, you know, when we're not here talking. But, but you know, it's cool. like you guys get to join us for a, right. we'll a session of deck down here by himself. So if you actually look, there are 13 uh, different cards here, I think. 6, 12, 13 times 3, which is 39. So the Dynasty deck is going to be 40 to 45 cards. So even if you include three copies of all of your clan cards, which we recommend just to, to get started, you still don't even have enough for a legal deck. It's just 39. So now you're gonna actually be looking at the neutral cards that can go in your dynasty deck. And again, you can't splash. So there's actually very, there's only a handful of options here. And the simplest thing to do is just pick two of them and put three each in. And you'll notice very quickly, um, you're either gonna pretty much be adding to the thing you're already good at or kind of doing something that you aren't doing. Covering up a weakness. So, now, hey, before, we, before you, you tell me what you're gonna choose over there. We need to make some choices so, here. Something that's worth noting is it's really helpful to read your kind of uh, like yes. clan province. Yeah, this the is the castle, the stronghold. The, the stronghold there. And that's gonna tell you basically, what is this ability kind of showing me about my clan? Yeah, so How is this clan gonna function? For the Lion Clan, uh, their action is during a conflict, they can battle their stronghold. So basically you get to do that once a turn. And each attacking character they control gets plus one to military until the end of the conflict. So what does that make you think about Lion? So it seems like they're going to be very military based. And? and because it's giving it to each character, they're probably going to be good at playing lower cost characters it's and got getting it. more characters on the board. So we immediately kind of go into the deck building process thinking, oh, well, there's going to be a lot of characters on the board, maybe kind of a swarmy style deck. I see this way of the Lion card over here that's saying <laughs> I'm doubling military stuff. strength. I see some other Lion cards that are playing on various concepts of that nature. Uh, so going in, if you just read through your clan's cards, particularly the Stronghold, that's going to give you a, a decent idea of what you're going to be looking to do when you start to make some of the, the better choices with your neutral cards. Yeah, and a really good start is if you lay out all the clan cards, you can look at your Stronghold, you can read through all these abilities, and you, you can even look at the different conflicts they're good at, the red stat is the military. And Lion is, as you can see, when these are all laid out, they're very good at military. And another good thing to do is actually check out the champion. So every yeah. clan has a champion, which is, this is like your big main character. But his ability is after you claim a ring during a military conflict in which this character is participating, resolve that ring's effect. So again, military. Military. So the thing this, the two kind of things Lion is really good at is having characters on the board, yeah. a lot of characters, right? And they want to have a lot of them attacking all at once and military. So when you're looking at the neutral cards, uh, you know, the question is, you, you see things like this Seppin Guardsman. It's like he's good at, at military. Great military. Uh, so a cheap body, which fits into the theme, also has a good military stat. Yeah. Uh, has a lot of Imperial favor text there. We don't really know if Lion's going to be doing much of that. Another, another thing with Night Lion that you might notice is that they have a lot of Bushy characters. So there are traits right here, and mm. nothing really triggers too much off Bushy in the character abilities. But when we get to the conflict, we will see cards that do trigger off of that. And you, you do see, too, I saw this right when I opened the core set, this two characters 
One of them, when you have a lot of Bushis in play, you get extra fate on that character, sure. this Matsu, which is amazing. Then you have the Sakoma that when you lose a political conflict, which I think we intend to be doing a decent bit of that in the, yeah, losing in political the game, conflicts. Uh, you can put a Bushi into play with cost three or lower. So, which is really good. Bushis are looking good in this deck too. And that's what makes me really like the Wandering Ronin. In particular for this deck, it's a neutral, it's a three cost Bushi who can actually get a whole lot of strength, both in political and military. So he's a nice little uh, option here for the Lion Clan. And I gotta say, in pretty much every deck that I've looked at, L5R, that Wandering Ronin may have a spot, because that ability just is exactly what you want it to be. It's as vanilla as possible. Yeah, he can basically remove a fate from himself to get plus two, plus two, mm -hmm. so he's good at political and military. But really, when you're looking through these neutrals, there's there's not wrong choices, so to speak. Just choose two. Uh, but choose two. I, I like to reinforce strengths myself um, instead of like trying to be good at political because you could pull political things or there's the, the one that removes attachments and you're just kind of just out of what they're trying to do. Uh, so if it were me choosing Lion, I would do the, the Guardsman and the, the Wandering Ronin. And we have a 45 card deck. And that's it. So essentially what we've done, we, we've opened our core sets, uh, of which we had three. So if you have less than three, let's say you have one core set, this also still applies, you're just gonna bring in more neutral characters. So you can always fill in that deck with slots that you don't have if you don't have the three core sets. But if you do have three, just three of every line character right off the bat, and then choose a couple of neutrals, do three of those, and then you're done. And I think what's, what's really important about this for me, and I know it's difficult, especially if you're new to game, but the sooner you dive in and actually get to the table and start playing, the faster you're gonna start learning what card you do and don't like. And a lot of times it's not even about which is the right choice of a card as much as it's which one do you like playing better because they have different different things. That's my favorite thing about games. Yeah, so very quickly you can build a dynasty deck. You now know your stronghold and kind of what your main characters are gonna be doing, uh, which is gonna be really helpful for the next decision, which is a little more complicated. So we're gonna move on to the conflict deck. Okay, and these are all of your tricks and tactics, things you're playing generally in combat to these, turn the tide of battle. These are the cards that are actually gonna be in your hand. And these are the ones you can play during conflict and it is, it is very much like the events and the attachments and that kind of thing. Let me, uh, let me give you a question, Zach. Can we do the exact same thing we just did with the Dynasty deck for the conflict deck? Can we lay out all the Lion cards and then add a couple of neutrals and be done? You could, uh, but I, I don't recommend that. So okay. there are a hand, there's a suite of neutral cards that I think out of the core set are universally good. It doesn't matter what your clan is, it doesn't matter what your characters are doing, they're just good. It's like in a lot of games, like the economy cards might be neutral right. or kind of I would put Sure Gamble in every in Netrunner, Netrunner or deck. like the Fiefdoms in Possibly. Thrones or it's that kind of a thing. So the uh, starting cards that I like to start my conflict deck with are the Ornate Fan, the Fine Katana, which these are just two attachments. One is free, they're both free, so you can play them during conflict. One gives you extra political, one gives you extra military. And even the lion is a military focused thing, you're still going with the ornate fan. Yeah, I think so. I mean, there probably is a case to take that out if you haven't, and we'll get to that point where you might be making that decision. Uh, but at the same time, that ability just to add strength to make a province not break or to break your opponent's province yeah, really surprise is, is pretty good. Assassination, it's a universal removal card. Gotcha. Yeah, it's zero cost, you just get rid of a two cost character. Almost always good. Bonsai in particular, is pretty much always good, but in line in particular, is really, really, really good. Yeah. Zero cost to give plus two, and you can lose an honor to make it plus two again. This is a really important card, and it makes sense because it is kind of the namesake of the game. Yep, we also have charge. So this is gonna let you, during a military conflict, bring a character from a province into play for one. And that's so good. Which is good, and then route, which is kind of the inverse of that, which is you can, during a military challenge, send someone home. And even if your clan is very politically based, I think, charge and route are very strong cards. And that's why like fine katana plus a charge or a route, you could just easily- Military out of nowhere. No, it doesn't matter what your clan is. You could just break a province from, from, from military. From but I, I think these are the like, start here. So now we have six stacks. So okay. that's 18 cards. Uh, and then when you actually start laying out the cards for the clan, uh, I'm just gonna put them out here so we can Get our and now eyes tell on me them. about these, these. We've seen the way of cards, you know, the way of lion, way of the crane, these kinds of things. And they also give us a little bit of a hint as to what the focus of the clan might be. And at the same time, they can be a little underwhelming, surprisingly, I found uh, in a couple of clans. Yeah, I, I, you know, as an example, I'm, I'm very interested by the Phoenix clan, and they mess with the rings, right? Like they're switching the ring type from military to political, switching the ring to a different ring, claiming the ring multiple times. That's one of their themes, right? But their, their way of card is, uh, you know, you can choose a ring and your opponent can't declare conflict of that type. And while that's good, it doesn't really do anything. Is it good enough? 
So it's, it's the wayouts are definitely not auto includes not in the same way that like assassination or bonsai are like immediately on my list of put it in my deck. Uh, so we laid out the cards here and we've got um, 13. Exactly. So technically we could have done the same 39 cards here with, with Lion. Uh, but then the neutrals I think are actually far more important in this deck, which is why we started there. Uh, but at this point, really, it's a matter of you already have... Uh, you got your six stacks. Eight, 18, so we're looking for 22 to 27 cards, because these decks are 40 to 45 cards. Uh, so, you know, seven or eight stacks from here, which is, is like half. I do, I do seven or eight stacks right from here. Yeah. Let's do that. All right. Let's look at it. Let's, let's pick them. We've got our stacks here. So now you just basically pick what seven stacks we want to say. Sure, is that right? Twenty-one. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with Way of the Lion. During a conflict, choose a lion character. Double that character's base military skill until the end of the conflict. It's in theme. I think that's powerful. It's free. Um, Going to be really good. Now there's there's a theme here that I'm interested in exploring, which is bringing characters in from your hand during a conflict. I feel like that a lot of times is so strong. In every other game that I've ever played, instant characters out of nowhere seems really strong. So is that something worth always considering in this you know, opening deck building process? Yeah, I mean, I think, so in the conflict deck, characters that you can include, they can be played at any time. They yeah. can be played directly into the conflict. They can be played in between conflicts. So there's definitely something about, uh, there's two characters, I think, for each clan that, that can be played in this deck right now. And the other side of that too is like, you know, something we've noticed is when we're playing out of that dynasty deck, we often end up with zero to one fate. Yeah. And so having six cards in my hand that are zero cost is incredible as compared to like a three cost master of the spear that is really competing with what I'm playing out of my provinces. Yeah, so I really like the Vengeful Oathkeeper because he actually can come into play for free. And then Master of the Spear is less obvious to me. He's really expensive. Three is a lot to have going into an actual conflict phase. But so, send somebody home. So, I mean, that's a great ability. And this is the kind of thing, it's probably a more advanced card. I wouldn't even put it into my opening deck. Yeah, I'm gonna- Let's cut him. I'm gonna cut him. Probably one of the best cards ever. <laughs> we're just Once we start playing, right but we'll just cut it. Uh, and uh, like we said earlier, we're gonna be posting a uh, deck list for each of the clans out of the core box. So if you're looking for a specific list for a specific clan, just to dive right in we will be doing that. I really like uh, Guidance of the Ancestors. Sure. Can I move that in there? That's just a plus one, plus one for one. It can always swing the tide. It can prevent something from breaking. And it always is playable It has the action, pile. which is play it from the discard pile. Yeah. And speaking it's there of that, I, I really like, I'm gonna just stack in the attachments. So these are the things that you can surprise your opponent with uh, strength. Sashimono and the Honor Blade. Yeah, like check that out. Attached characters not bow as a result of conflict resolution during military. So you Pretty have good. like a really stacked up military guy and you just leave him, leave him in. Uh, and then, you know, another good sign typically of these things, if you look at the bottom of the card, there's an influence cost. And so influence is a, a stat you can use to splash from another clan. And and those little scrolls, right? Yeah, the scrolls. And so we're not, we're not gonna do that with this deck uh, on, the, on the video, but in the Lion blog, we probably will. But if you look, a lot of times the more powerful cards have a higher influence cost, like the Master of the Spear. I think he does have a very powerful ability, and for any clan that can get a lot of resources and fate going into the conflict phase, he's really powerful. So that's kind of a good, cheap way to say, well, this is probably a pretty powerful card if they're costing a lot to bring it out of faction. Absolutely, of and so that leads me to For Greater Glory. It's a three cost, uh, and it's incredibly good, very powerful. After you break a province during a military conflict, place a fate on each participating Bushi character you control. Yeah, that's amazing. Fits with the theme. <laughs> it's unbelievable. And it's, only, it's only one? That is insane. It's <laughs> awesome. So we're at 36 cards, um, and very quickly we are down to really needing to choose probably two more stacks. Let's do it. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and grab strength of, strength of numbers and Ready for battle. Strength in numbers, that makes sense, right? Does that uh, have to do with numbers? While you're attacking player, choose a defending character with glory X or lower. Move that character home. X is the number of attacking characters. Yeah, perfect. So for okay. one, so that fits our theme. Home. Uh, and then ready for battle is after an opponent's card effect or a ring effect bows a character you control, you can ready it. So this is just a free, doesn't let them bow your things. So essentially, you know, we got out of this just cutting a couple of lion cards, including the six that you're sure are uh, worth putting in pretty much every deck yeah, out of the and, core set. And I think, you know, if you're laying the cards out and you're reading through them, and again, I do not recommend spending a ton of time trying to make this decision. We, we have deck lists that you can use if you want something that's really well thought out in advance. But the faster you get to the table, the faster you're gonna learn whether or not you value these cards. But 
even these six, right? Like if you more cards come out or out of the core set, you're like, I really like these lion cards. Um, just put it in the order you want. Very quickly lets you see like what cards maybe shouldn't belong and what you might want to take out. Absolutely. All right, so the six neutrals and then eight from, from Lion. Yeah, and so it looks Three like we, we cut two of the Lion, Lion Clan cards and all of a sudden we have a conflict ready to go. And that brings us to the last uh, element of building a deck, which is the provinces. And this, I recommend building provinces at the end of the deck building process. Uh, because once you know what your clan is trying to do, what kind of characters you're gonna have on the board and the events that you have in your deck, it's gonna let you really put value on some of these abilities that these provinces have. So we're gonna run through all the provinces. I noticed that there is one that is themed to Lion. Yeah, so uh, when it comes to provinces, you have to bring five, and you have to bring one for every element in the game. Out of the core set, there's two for each element, plus your clan specifically has a province that it has, and it is one of the elements. So in this case, it looks like Lion has water, and so we're gonna have three choices when it comes down to water. So let's start there. Uh, what do we got? What do we got? I feel like one? out of the course is like I should just choose the clan one. Let's right? do it. I mean, it's special. <laughs> Cancel it. It's special. Just always choose your clan province. I mean, it may not turn out like that, but like I said, we're just trying to get to the table. So let's just choose the clan province. All right, we're gonna move on. Let's move to Earth. I think that's the next good consideration. So a lot of times, these Earth, you have to put one of these provinces under your stronghold, and it's very common for the Earth one to be the one that goes under because out of the core set. The Ancestral Lands gives you plus five military or political strength when it's being attacked. And Transposition gives you an extra five military strength. So a really the suggested tactic is choose the one you're weaker at. So in this case, Lion is weaker at political. And use that and put it under your stronghold. That makes sense, right? So you presume that if your opponent is attacking you in the grand finale, trying to take you down and win the game, you will have enough military on the board to prevent that from getting over, you know, five yeah. out of your standard province. So like, but what you don't know is if I don't have any political on the board, now they at least still have to get 10 strength to, to sure. break this open, and, so you that's know, important. There's the, the reality of if you're playing Lion, you don't have a ton of political, so if it gets knelt, if it gets sent home, you only have so many characters that can even be in that conflict. Yeah. So, but. Again, that is part of why something like the, uh, the fan that yeah. we were talking about earlier is actually really good because if you can get someone in there, uh, all you have to do is not let them get that, the amount of strength they need to win the game uh, and it, it can be a game-breaking kind of card. So let's move along to air. Air, during conflict I can draw a card as an action or I can gain a fate. Uh, both great. So I mean, for me this is like, if your conflict deck has more expensive cards, I would probably go with the Fate resource. Like if we had put our Master of Spear in, for and instance. If your conflict has cheaper cards and just having more of them means that you're gonna have more options, Fertile Fields is a really good option. I think unless there's a reason to go Manicure Guard. I mean, it, these are both great. I, uh, resource card, and card. Get, just yeah. get cards though. Yeah. You know? So we'll go cards on this, this choice. Uh, and then we'll move on to Void. Uh, so we have Shameful Display. During a conflict of this province, choose two participating characters, honor one and dishonor the other. Okay. So Pilgrimage, during conflicts at this province, cancel all ring effects. Okay, but if you break it, you resolve them as normal. And important to note, three province value versus five province value. So Absolutely. shameful display, a lot easier to break. Yeah, uh, Lion isn't really messing with honoring or dishonoring characters too much. So I don't think there's a ton of value in that. Uh, as much as canceling a ring effect, so if your opponent does send uh, a ring challenge at you that you... Like a big void challenge. A big void. So I'm going to vote on Pilgrimage unless you have Let's a case Pilgrimage, against sure. it. And then, I do like honoring uh, a lot of those lion cards. Sure. Uh, honoring is great. I'm worried about it. It's not three. bad. Uh, and then finally we get to fire. Uh, we have Meditations of the... Dao. Dao. I always want to say Tao and that's just wrong. <laughs> Action. During a conflict of this province, Got it. choose an attacking character. Remove a fate from that character. Or Night Raid, after this province is revealed, your opponent chooses and discards X cards from his or her hand. X is equal to the number of attacking Both characters. That's great. I mean, in just situational, it's fire. It's so good. I mean, they're so nicely fire. They could be awesome, or they could just go right out. It is fire. I think, with, for me, Lion, like, I'm thinking about the conflict deck, and we have Route, and we have uh, the other card that sends someone home, and maybe if we'd put the uh, other guy that sends someone home, the, the character that we keep talking about. Yeah. Uh, but... I kind of like removing the fate because if, if I can keep their board in check, I'm not sure to they're going to have enough characters to combat what I'm doing. Absolutely, yeah. Let's let's do that. And let's that get meditations on the down there. And that looks good. 
All right, so there's our five, uh, we've done it, our five provinces. There it is. And so at this point, we have a ready to go lion deck, right? So we have our stronghold. We have chosen all of our dynasty deck, mm -hmm. which was probably the simplest part. And so again, the dynasty deck, you would just choose all of your clan cards, three yep. of everything, and then add a couple from the neutral stack that fit whatever themes your deck is looking to explore. And out of the core set, it should be pretty obvious. It's, it's pretty there's simple. There's like two to three things that you can pretty much you know, figure the, out. The one, one thing to really note on the dynasty deck as well, I didn't know this at first, which is uh, if a unique character shows up in your province that's already in play, you can get rid of that character from the province oh, yeah. to put a fate on it. Not awesome. So that's really what makes it just totally fine to use three of everything. Because yeah. you actually, the big, expensive, unique guys, you want multiples of to put extra fate on for free. But then we move on to the conflict deck, and that's where it does get a little stickier. Because if, I don't think you want to put all the clan cards. Uh, but again, if you start with that starting group of neutrals. the power six. The power six. Uh, there, should, there should be a clever nickname for that. But include those cards, and then ultimately cut a couple of the clan cards, and you have a deck ready to go. And then once you understand all that and what's going on, I think you get to the provinces, and the choices become pretty straightforward. Pretty straightforward. You could literally flip a coin on these and probably be okay if you had to. Um, and another th thing with the um, with the conflict deck is there is a number of neutral cards in here that could be potentially added to a deck. Like, you know, there's a, a ton of stuff. There's stuff that's, you know, Cloud the Mind, like this kind of stuff, stringing so, off Shugenja characters. Yeah, and I think that's one thing. Got a really lot of know. Shugenjas? There's, there's a lot of, new, of the neutral cards in the conflict deck that for other clans will absolutely want to make it into that, like, these are the ones you always include kind of a situation. Yeah. So again, we will be posting video, gameplay videos of us using fully fleshed out decks that you can watch soon, and also blogs that have decks from the core set for you ready to go uh, if, if you don't want to have to, like, you know, dance around and figure out what to put in your deck. But I'll tell you, this is the easiest way to do it. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Just, just put it together and then get to playing. That's right. There you have it. Just keep it simple and start playing L5R. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching. We have plenty of L5R videos on the channel that you can catch. We also have an L5R subscription service. We'll be sending the Sakura token exclusively and for free with all core set pre-orders and box and pack subscriptions for the first cycle of Legend of the Five Rings. You can learn more about that on the website, and until next time, keep playing.